Welcome back to the podcast. I hope you're all well and perhaps you're out fishing. And if you are, I hope you're catching a few fish too. First, I wanted to alert you to the fact that there will be a march on the 26th of October in London, organised by River Action. I'll be there and hope you'll get along too. For more details, visit marchforcleanwater.org. So, my guest today, he's a Ukrainian living in Germany, who I'm sure a number of you will know. He has a passion for catching many species of fish on the fly, so I'm hoping to learn a little about what he gets up to. I'm really pleased to be joined today by Alex Red Hat. Alex, it's great to have you on the podcast. Are you well? It's all great. Thank you, Pete. Fantastic. Good. Now, Alex Red Hat, I know that's a moniker of yours. Is there a reason? Where did this name come from? Because uh, like myself, I follow you on social media and know you as Alex Red Hat, but that's not actually your name, is it? Yeah, it's not my name. It's, it's a nickname I picked up for the fly fishing community. The story is actually very simple. Many people ask me about this, but there's nothing really like secret behind it. I I used the laptop with the red had Linux system and I always had a sticker on my laptop and I kind of like it. And when I started to create my social profile, I decided just to use that name because it's just the first thing that came to my mind. And yeah, it got stuck with me. Um, so it's actually funny. Some people ask me why I don't wear the red hat when I fish and stuff. And I actually don't recommend wearing the red hat because it scares the fish off. And I, I only wear it for the social events. So I'm kind of like a black hat in reality because I have a black hat when I fish. But nothing seriously special about this. But I like this name. And for listeners, you won't be able to see this, but Alex is actually wearing a red hat right now. So it sounds nice and apt. But can you tell us a little bit about where you're based and what that means from a fishing perspective? Yeah, so I moved to Germany in 2008, yes. Um, before that, I've been in the United States a little bit for four years in Seattle. Yeah, we talked about it. It's actually a destination. I kind of regret that I didn't fly fish, but most of you know that Washington is like perfect state for fly fishing, steelhead and everything about it. So in my mind, I always get back to this and kind of regret it. But anyway, but I actually started fly fishing in Germany when I moved in 2008 because I met a friend of mine also from Ukraine. He introduced me to the fly fishing and everything that goes with it. And I started to go with him more often. And then it became really my obsession. Actually, the, the city where I moved, it's called Göttingen. It's like right in the middle of the Germany. And it has this perfect chalk stream and it's only grayling and trout. So it's like, you must do fly fishing. You just cannot avoid this. And yeah, this is the, the river where I learned everything. So I'm kind of self-taught. He introduced me to the basics, but most of the fight to become a fly fisherman, I've done it on myself. I met a lot of people that did give me tips and I observed them and learned a lot about them, but it's mostly me and fly rod that we had the relationship yeah it was tough at the beginning but slowly as i told you it kind of consumed me completely and i went 100 percent to fly fishing and since five years i only fish with fire rod i'm currently at a different city it's called hanover it's not that far away from original destination i'm also uh, on weekends on berlin so i'm kind of in between two cities so yeah uh in terms of fly fishing um uh, the vocation decides what I do. This is how I kind of became a multi-species angler because we don't have many rivers here that will be specifically only trout or like graining. So I had to switch to uh, some alternatives and like, for example, pike or carp, and we have abundance of this in the place where I live. So I kind of became really focused on those fish. So, but in Berlin area, we have a lot of uh, trout waters. Actually, there is one river where they start to introduce the salmon, and I'm really hopeful that it will become a stable population because it was completely instinct from there. But they do an amazing job on bringing the salmon back. But they have amazing wild brown trout, grayling, and so these are also good waters for the trout fishing. And actually, those are the waters that I guide, but we will talk about this later, I guess. That sounds a really nice mix of fishing that you're able to enjoy. And when you made that switch to fly fishing, you said that you picked up some advice from friends and you observed friends. And also, I guess, starting to fish on a chalk stream allowed you to observe the fish too. Is that right? 
Yeah, that's true. That that stream is actually very interesting. Uh, in the summer, it becomes a classical dry water uh, river, I would say. A lot of fish rising, especially grayling, they rise like crazy. But they, but the window is so short, like you have to wait almost to the darkness. It's just like one hour before the sunset. And this is how I learned dry fire fishing, actually, because, thanks to that river. Because before that, I tried a little bit nymphs and streamers, but it was not working very well. And then in the middle of the summer, I learned that this is really, really good dry fire water. So this is how I learned to fish for, with the dry fire. And for you, Germany, we, we sell magazines out into Germany. And I don't know so much about the fly fishing scene, but what I've learned about it over the years is that it's quite sizable and there's very passionate anglers too. Is, is that the sort of case? Am I sort of in the right direction? That's true. I was actually surprised that the fly community here is very, very big. And it's actually, we will talk about this later for, in terms of company, but this is where we sell most of the rods from the company that I am associated with. But the fly community is extremely big. But it's also decided by the region where you live. Because the Germany is kind of big country and it's expanded from south until north. And then like the landscape changes very drastically. So you have... In southern regions, a lot of these uh, mountain creeks and mountain rivers. And there I would say the fly fishing community is the biggest, but it's like more conservative kind of uh, community of fly anglers. And then once you move, move towards the north, everything changes. So you have more flat areas, more big rivers, and then people fish more for predatory fish like pike, perch, carp and then you go the maximum north then you have a baltic sea i mean the Ostsee, uh, sea we call it yes this becomes a big community of the sea trout and like everything that has to do with the coast and this is like i would divide this germany by like three category of anglers you know like kind of coarse mixed species anglers like classical fly anglers and like on the north it's a coastal anglers i would call them so this defines where you live how which kind of fly angler you are and when you moved, was it difficult making that change from trout and grayling on these streams that you learnt your trade on to go look for carp and pike? Was that was it a difficult change that you had to make, and was was it an enjoyable one in a different way? Oh, it wasn't actually that difficult because uh, I, as I told you, I haven't not, not always been a fire angler only, so I. My history goes back with kind of relationship with my brother. We all started as a coarse anglers. So we fished for other species like carp and pike as well. But I learned from these, about these species from completely different perspective. Like when you are a fly angler, you see those fish completely differently when you're a coarse angler. For example, carp, I started to observe them a lot. And I also listened to a lot of your podcasts. So it's more stalking looking for fish looking what it does and like learning really about its behavior because when we fish as a coarse anglers you just get like a run on the on the rod and you don't know what's happening on the other end it's like it's it's okay i guess but it you learn it completely differently when you see the carp like how they move how they interact with each other like how they react to the bait and I always uh, tell this story that I learned there are big fish and they're like smaller carp and these small carp I actually hate because they're always on the watch. They are like guardians for the big fish. And I like every time I see the small ones, I was like, you're not going to catch anything today because they are always on alert and like they see you first and then they spook the big ones because they tell them like just run away. Right. So I learned a lot about the carp and the pike. Also, I wasn't a big fan of pikes to be honest like i didn't have so much interest in that fish but i met a very uh, obsessed pike angler but he was actually a spring angler and he was sort of kind of for me a competition and i decided yeah i'm gonna challenge myself and i'm gonna learn how to fish for pike and then and then it became really my obsession you know pete it's like pike is like the the badass of the water, like the take, the everything. I love this fish. It's just, you close your eyes at night and you still see how it takes your streamer. And I really became obsessed with pike fishing for some time because we have a lot of them, first of all. And then I learned a lot from internet, 
like tying streamers and everything and it became kind of my passion also for fishing for pike and then you ask me about the asp this is my biggest love forever i actually always say that this fish converted me to the fly angler uh, 100 percent because i was still doing a little bit of mixture fly rod and then the other methods and i really wanted to catch that fish like it was really obsession for more than four or five years when i was a spin angler and i still couldn't catch it and you can't believe it but the moment I switched to the fly rod, I finally caught that fish. And then I decided from that moment, I'm going to be a fly angler only. And I'm going to catch asp only on the fly. But we can talk about asp more a little bit if you want, because I, I really learned a lot through the years how to fish for that fish specifically. Absolutely. I'd really like to learn more. I've heard a little bit about the asp, but I'm sure listeners may know a little bit. They may not know much about them. But can you tell us a little bit about, describe them as a fish and the sorts of places that you're fishing for them and how you're fishing for them as well? Yeah, absolutely. So asp is a very unique fish, I think, because if you, if you describe just with simple words, it's basically a carp fish that got mad and decided, I want to be a pike now. So it's a, it belongs to the carp family, but it's 100% predatory fish. It only eats bait. And from there, it raises a lot of questions. So like, as I told you, I, the more I catch those fish, I always think that I get more answers from it, but I actually get more questions from it. It's like, does the size of the bait matters? Does the smell of the bait matters? Because the carp family fish, they actually rely on smell a lot. And like, it's actually very smart. It's very explosive fish. So the way we also have debate about this was a friend of mine that is also obsessed about this fish. Because the way it hunts, it's actually, in my perspective, it creates the shock wave with the body. So it knocks the small bait out. And then and then it makes a quick circle and then it picks up those disoriented fish. My friend with me kind of disagrees on this one, but I have a lot of like data and observations that I still believe that my theory is right. Uh, because the fit, you see the fish, you can spot them. They are like explosive explosions like someone drops the grenade in the water this is how they attack attack the bait but here comes the confusion with this because it's it's actually despite being so obvious fish it's extremely extremely careful it sees everything it makes everything so you have to stay really long distance away from actually the place where it hunts and you actually have to think and observe how the fish moves because after the attack it can be already too meters away from the spot where it attacked. So you have to present the streamer strategically. So I always observe them a little bit, which area it hunts, and then I adjust my casting accordingly. In terms of bait, this is also an interesting topic that I always debate with my friend. I use small bait. So because this is the main course of this fish, it cannot really take really big bait. But the spin anglers, sometimes they do catch it on the big bait. And for me, it's a kind of a mystery. My theory is that actually this fish is very territorial. It doesn't like any other predatory fish that would hunt in the place where it lives. So I think spin anglers catch them because they are angry. They just want to chase the other predatory fish away and then they take this bait. But still, as I told you, you can write books about this and still and fish all your life for this fish and still learn not enough to understand it completely. But this is how I love this process of learning how you fish for the ice. I really like the idea of them as a fish and a species that I know so little about and this predatory behavior of them. And I was thinking about how, how you were talking about getting the fly to them. So does that mean if the asp have stunned their prey, when you've cast a, a fish, does that mean that you're going to move it very, very slowly? Are you trying to represent a uh, stunned fish or are you trying to represent one that's trying to get away from being eaten by the asp uh, the one that tries to get away so you have to strip i call this call it strip as fast as there is no tomorrow like you have to strip extremely fast like otherwise it will just not react and this also creates a potential for um, not potential i mean some debate how you actually i actually vary my fishing I don't necessarily always cast to the place where the fish attacked. I observe and see the, how the fish moves. And sometimes when I don't see attacks anymore, I just present the streamer approximately where the bait is. And sometimes when the streamer, since it behaves like not normal, like a fish that has been knocked out, sometimes they grab them 
without being obvious that they hunt for them. So you have to really observe a lot and make your decisions how you really want to fish, but it doesn't have to be exactly always one way. You have to really learn and adapt to the situation. Have you thought about, it's just got me thinking about um, stunted, you know, or stunned, sorry, uh, bait fish and sort of a floating stunned fish. Is there a way of doing that? And do you think it could work? Uh, it might actually, I, as I said, there is no uh, limit for experimenting with this fish. A friend of mine, for example, he puts multiple streamers on one leader. So it imitates like a small swarm of fish that it wants to attack. This is like really hard to cast this thing, but, uh, yeah, he have adopted some of the things that you, you can actually cast this. I don't fish with multiple streamers because I'm not a big fan of multiple hooks. You can also create streamers without hooks and then just only one streamer with the hook as a as a as an option. But as I said, you can you can play with this fish anything that you can imagine doing. Like it seriously needs studying all your life to adapt, like really to find what it hunts, how it hunts, and what it actually prefers. I really do like the sound of that. What sort of water are you fishing? Where are you heading to 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 catch these fish yeah so that took me a while actually to find the water that is suitable for them and i have uh, my favorite water for them now it's uh, river elba uh, it's one of the biggest rivers in germany that goes to the north sea and uh, right and i fish in the city that is called magdeburg it's closer already to the end of the river but not yet and this river is very specific because it has these, uh, it's hard to describe what they are. It's artificially made like little barriers for the people either to load the boats or slow down the current. And these are actually perfect habitat places for the fish because you have this central quick running uh, current and then you have these side pockets with like a combination of small water and the current. And this is exactly where these fish live because the bait fish, they try to hide in these little pockets because the, there's vegetations and everything. And these asp, they live in the current because they feel safe. And then they call from this current to attack those little pockets. And this is like a perfect habitat for this. And I developed like huge, big love for this river. I learned a lot about it, like exactly where they live. So this is my favorite water. But one can actually go to Hamburg as well. This is almost the end of the river. But it's somewhat, somehow similar kind of style of fishing, but there it's more urban fishing i mean i mean buildings people it's kind of because the way i fish it's a little bit more wildish so i prefer that kind of river but elbe in general has a lot of these fish i can picture that river a little bit because i went to hamburg many many years ago and i kind of remember being obsessed by the river there and seeing it so i kind of know where you you are talking about certainly from the urban side of things but also uh, is this where you're you're catching pike? Are you fishing the same place for for pike too? No, no. Uh, pi uh, this river has pike as well, but for pike, I have my home waters. We have a lot of uh, big lakes, a like gravel pits called yeah in English. Yeah, like uh, very deep, clear water lakes, and then we have a lot of pikes there. So for the pike, I prefer the visual aspect so i always like that when they take the streamer i rarely fish like in very big depths uh, so i don't see the fish attack i actually prefer like closer casts and then see how the fish takes the streamer this is one place where i fish for pike and the second place my favorite is actually it's called island Eugen. i don't know if you heard about it it's uh it's like the most northern part of the germany it's actually an island and there, I would say to describe you and you, the listeners, what kind of fishing is this? It's like, imagine if you would do the sea trout fishing, but only for pike. So it's like a shallow water there. You wait for it and then you get attacks like almost near to your feet. Like there's like maybe one meter depth. And then you really see those fish like really exploding like, like crazy. And it's very close contact. So I love this kind of fishing there. I go off and again, it's like, kind of a little bit far away but i tried to do at least one or two trips there and this is like amazing pike water and they also it's very spe special pike water because um, they feed on everything that comes from the sea 
So this is a brackish water. It's a mix of salt water and the, and the fresh water. And the salt water species, they come sometimes to these uh, places and then pike feed on them. And they grow way faster than any other pike in Germany. So you have enormous pike there. They are like two times faster growing than any other places. So there's huge chances for very big fish to catch in Rügen. And actually, amazingly, some extremely big fish have been caught there. Now you mentioned that, I know exactly where you mean. And that's been, I think that's almost a bucket list destination as well. I th- it sounds phenomenal fun. And that's where I have to say, that's why I asked where you fish for asp, because I sort of had that feel that that might be a similar sort of thing for the asp as well, but but clearly not. No, no, the completely different habitats and completely different approaches. So I keep my asp fishing separately from pike fishing. Well, Elbe has a lot of big pikes as well and catfish, but since I, I really like this fish, I always, when I go for it, I focus on it and I don't try to not get distracted by any other species. Nice. Well, I think you've got two fantastic ones and two uh, some amazing destinations as well. So it's been wonderful to learn a little bit about a fish that, yeah, is, is going to start nibbling away at me, I think, just a little bit. And I'm going to give it a little bit too much thought. But um, I wanted to move on a little bit because I know when we were messaging and talking to each other that you've been in Poland. So what were you doing over there? I, I'm guessing you were doing some fishing, but what were you up to? Yeah, this is first time I went there was invited by a friend uh it's uh it's called it's a river called dunayets and I, I highly recommend you that maybe one day you also go there and make a completely story about this i i want to advertise this place right now a little bit because i've actually been the first time so i just learned about it it's a mountain kind of river type with relatively fast current and Super incredibly nice destination, has a lot of brown trout. They have abundance of really nice fish there. Uh, mostly nymphing, uh, this is the most popular method there, but they do dry dry fly fishing as well. In the evening, there's some activity also on the surface. But for me, this river is a little bit more interesting from different perspective because, as I said, I'm a little bit of fish species hunter. It has a fish that I've been kind of hunting for quite a while now. Uh, you don't have it in the UK. It's called uh, Nase. It has a kind of the name is because it has a it's kind of a funny form from the mouth front. It's kind of like sticking out. Polish people said they call it like a piggy a little bit, which is kind of sad for me, unfair. I think it's beautiful fish. Yeah, it's a bottom feeder. Uh, it lives together with barbel. They always live in a mixture, those two fish. Right, and very interesting fish, very hard-fighting fish, but very difficult to catch. They eat algae and small crustaceans from the stones. That's why they have this mouth form, to scrap everything from the stones. Yeah, and this was my target fish. And unfortunately, I, I, I was never so unhappy to catch many big brown trout because every time, every bite, I was hoping, finally, it's that fish, finally, it's that fish. I was like, no, brown trout nonstop. And then in the end, in addition, then the barbo started to take nymphs, which is what even more upsetting, even though barbo is hard to fish to uh, catch on on the fly, but there's like so many barbo and they are gigantic and you have to use 0.12 tippet. And I couldn't even land those barbo because they were so big, they would always break the nymph. So it was a little bit of a disaster, but really fun trip, I would say. But I learned a lot. I think next time I will finally catch that fish. The friend of, I, of mine that was with me, that he did catch that fish. Yeah, finally saw it, at least in the flash, how it looks. But yeah, it's a challenging fish, but I, I'm hoping next time I will get it. Means you got to go back again, right? Yeah, definitely must do. <laughs> that sounds really, really interesting. Um, you said about observation and you said you you fish fish with a friend in Poland as well. But how do you like to fish? Do you like to fish with somebody, or do you like to fish alone? And I asked that because you said about observation that I kind of pictured you sitting on a, a river bank or on a, the edge of a lake or wherever it may be, watching closely. Does that mean that you like to fish alone? I do fish alone a lot. Um... I am more successful when I fish alone, but many people on your post- podcast, I think, also said that. Um, I do enjoy the company of fishing, nevertheless. 
However, some species actually demand to be fishing alone. For example, the asp, as I told you, uh, I think I tried a few times fishing with friends and we were not so successful. Uh, partially, I think it's because of fish being very um, scared of noises and every everything that's happening on the bank. So I don't know, even if I'm always thinking how to guide people actually for this fish. So maybe I have to stay as far as possible and just give them directions what to do. But I've noticed, unfortunately, for this fish, fishing for too many people on the bank, unfortunately, results in the failure. But in general, I do if I fish a lot because I, I have to really concentrate on what I'm doing, thinking about all my uh, things that I do on the bank. But I, as I said, I really enjoy the company as well when other people come. But some methods demand, unfortunately, fishing alone to learn more about the fish. Sounds a, yeah, I'm really fascinated by this. So I'm going to go and do some more research on ASP when we finish talking as well. It sounds amazing. Uh, I mentioned in the introduction that you're from Ukraine and that you were trying to set up a fly fishing team there as the invasion happened. Are you in touch with fishing friends there? Yeah, we have a, a special club, I would say. No, it's not a club. It's like an organization. It's a Ukrainian fly fishing league. And right, so their goal is actually to participate in the world championship for fly fishing. It has been a long time goal for them. The Ukrainian team actually did participate once in the world uh, fly fishing competition. But after that, it all got a little bit uh, rusty and nothing happening. So we decided to bring this process back. So I was a lot of in contact with FIPS and we tried to set up the documents, membership and everything. But as you know, unfortunately, the full invasion war came and this project had sadly died. But the organization still exists. I'm still in touch with those people. I really enjoy talking to them. Ukraine is actually a very good destination for fly fishing. Not right now, but hopefully in the future uh, because it has a lot of interesting species. We have a lot of similar rivers to that one that I visited in Poland. So it's like clean, fast flowing uh, rivers with some trout, with grayling. We have hucho as well. You know this fish probably. Yeah. And this Poland river actually has hucho as well. This was my second, but it's not the right season for it. it. I have to wait until fall. This is the best time for them. But it's possible to catch those fish there too. So yeah, I keep the contact with them. Some of them, unfortunately, have to change their life and go to the front line. So we collect the money where we can and try to donate some money to them to help them out. But yeah, this project still lives. I'm still staying positive that one day we will participate in World Championship and we'll see how it goes. Well, let's stay in touch about that because anything I can do to help that, I would love to to be able to do that, be it gear or whatever, to get a team together when they're able to do so. And can you also send them our love and best wishes from the fishing community? We're thinking, and I know every day I'm, I look and see what's happening there, and we think about these people and, and what they're having to, to deal with right now. So please send, send our love to them. Thank you, Pete. Appreciate it. You mentioned some guiding early on. Is that something that you do much of? Do you enjoy guiding? I decided to try that as a next step uh, in my fly fishing passion. Uh, we have um, we have an organization that is called uh, Firos. They do guidings for the for the people and organize the trips. Um, yeah, I don't do much guiding, but I try to do a little bit of it. So I. I think it's important to learn how to guide people. It opens up completely different perspective on fly fishing and how to approach it. Because one thing is when you catch a fish, but, you know, explaining this to other people and make them actually catch fish, it's completely different level of skills. So, yeah, we do some basic courses. So we don't do very advanced things. We introduce people to the basic stuff. So we want to really ignite this fire that the new people will come into our hobby. Uh, first of all, I cannot do advanced things because I'm not a casting instructor or a certified person. So I only can introduce them to the basic stuff that I kind of learned, but more 
advanced one, I always recommend them to go hire a person that is more advanced to explain them the tricks and stuff. But yeah, I do mostly guiding in the trout waters in near Berlin area because this is where most possible and mo I know these waters pretty well. So most of the people actually want to catch trout because they think fly fishing is only for trout, which I kind of always disagree with them. You can catch any fish with fly, theoretically any, but yeah. So yeah, I do guidings for basic uh, uh, clients in this area and also I've, I've just uh, talking to you today and i know your background which we'll touch on a little bit later but you're data driven have you thought about writing about as for example on a technical basis on a how-to basis because it, it strikes me that you would be a person ideally placed to actually do so it's a nice compliment, but I'm afraid I have to deny this compliment because I know more people that are actually more advanced of knowing this fish. And um, there's a person called Band Teich. Uh, I hope I spelled the name correctly. He he knows way way more than me. He's like a bit modest. He doesn't post too much about this, but we talk a lot about this fish with him. I think he would be the one that should write the book about it. I'm still in a learning process. It's like a lot of things i know but a lot of things i don't know but i constantly think about this idea as well i actually was even thinking like maybe send an article to your magazine maybe for people would be interesting but i don't know if i'm such a good writer i'll try it one day for sure i promise me but let's see well i'd look forward to seeing that so please send across but i'm always fascinated by people who work on data and research into why something happens rather than gut. And that's why it, it struck me that I think that, and I'm somebody who works on gut, I have to say, but um, it, I always love to talk with people who go in depth about it. And I, I, I think because of the way that you look at things, I think personally you'd be able to do something like that, be it an article, possibly a book or or, or whatever about the fishing that you have in your part of the world. I, I think it would be really, really interesting. And you could put me down for that. I'd, I'd certainly be interested in that. But I want you to move on to tackle and use a fly rod that is a little different. Can you tell us why you settled on it and why you like it? Yeah, so I am pro staff member for the company that is called Arctic Silver Fly Fishing. It's um, it's a company that makes rods and fly lines. It's a unique concept that no other company does this um, in order to describe this. So it was founded by a, a guy called Robert Selfos. And the idea behind the construction of such a specific rod was uh, he actually had a small injury, I think in the shoulder. So he couldn't cast like really heavy rods. So his idea was uh, to design the rod where you would use minimal energy but still can cast uh, high classes rods without any problem and this this resulted in the in this concept which is called free flex what happens is that we we have a moving blank until uh, the wrist so the blank freely moves inside the handle and this is why we have this such a unique uh, looking handle and what it allows us, it allows to use completely 100% uh, uh, abilities of the blank. So you use minimal energy, but you, in the end, you load the line way faster than any other conventional rods because they are glued in front of the cork. So you don't use this little last 10 centimeters of the blank. Right. So this is how this concept was built. And then, uh, yeah, we have a variety range of rods. We kind of focus a little bit more on the sea trout because a lot of members from our teams are keen sea trout anglers. So it's a coastal road. So they allow you to cast a little bit further without with minimum energy. So it's hard to describe this. We always that's why we always go to the we go to presentations because you have to kind of feel it. It's hard to describe it when but when the people take the rod in their hands they were so surprised that they can cast so further without such a minimal energy use and it helps you to save some energy by the end of the day because when you're casting all day long then you get tired quickly but with our roads i noticed that you you can cast way longer and then you don't get tired or any pain or something like this 
right? So we make rods in the range for, for trout fishing, for sea trout, and also pike series. Like we also became very, as I told you, because in Germany, a lot of people fish for pike, and this is our main kind of category of interest. So we sell a lot of pike rods in the Germany and our pike rods allow to cast like really bulky, big streamers also with minimal in energy effort. It's worth having a look on Alex's social media. You'll see the rods on there. They've been around a little while now, haven't they? Yeah, 10 years. I think this is the time since the company was founded and started to operate. Right. So, but since then we had only one uh, rod series at the beginning. They were called Zens, but now we have developed several other models and actually new models are coming. And actually we will change the concept even further. This is going to come out at the end of the year, if I'm not wrong. We will now make the handle that not only has a free flex in it, you will be able to exchange the blanks. So you just buy one handle and then you just buy blanks from us and you can adapt to any situation. You just come fish for trout, then you see some pike, you just remove the blank, insert the blank for, for the pike rod, and then you're good to go. So we will see. We will see this by the end of the year. I hope this will be very interesting for the people to try. What a great idea. And, and it's quite a radical design, which, again, is based on fact, I guess, more than anything else. Do you find, though, it is a difficult one, like we're trying to do now, to explain the rod? Because I think about here and I think about the composite handles and I think Wind Grip did a rod handle in red for Reddington, which is a they make uh, golf handles. And I used one and I had one and I thought it was really, really good. But is it a challenge to sort of win anglers over or is it a case of once they try it, they think, ah, yes, this makes a lot of sense? Uh, yeah, you kind of answered the question. Uh, yes, it's challenging. As I told you, the more south you go in Germany, the more conservative the fly anglers are. And they prefer, of course, cork material and classical setup. Our rods are a little bit completely different looking. But the first thing they don't understand is we didn't design the rod handle that it looks different from the other fly rods. This was not intention. It has to be designed this way that allows this blank to move freely inside the handle. So this is their first complaint. They come, oh, we want this classical handle, this and that. But then I give them to try to cast this and then they see how different the rod when it casts and it's so much more effective and more pleasant. And then some of them do change their mind, but as I said, they're always uh, fans of like classical setup. And I, I, don't, I don't mind this. I, I give you people opportunity, they can try it and then decide for themselves if it uh, fits for them or not. I'm not th that religious to say you have to abandon the cork and this and that. I'm, I'm very flexible on this topic. We, we just try to new, make new things and try people to try it. And if they like it, they, they, they like it. It's really interesting what you said there about the further you move into trout country, the more traditional people are. And do you think that is a function of people looking at other species are more open-minded, not just to the species, but also to the tackle too? Uh, I think it also depends on the uh, age category. We actually did some surveys for our company that majority of people that are interested in our products are a little bit younger category. There, the classical trout stream uh, locations in the South Germany, it's often older people, so they kind of come from this uh, concept of classical fire rods. So for them, it's a little bit difficult to uh, accept this. So, yeah. Maybe it's age, maybe something else, maybe species that you go after. As I said, trout may be nicer to have a classical fire rod. But as I said, some of our rods, we have actually a person in our team that actually is bamboo fire, a bamboo rod maker. And he actually uses fire lines from us and he's like super satisfied with it. He said, so this is the best fire lines for the bamboo rods ever. And But he fishes with our rods as well. And he said that this is like a modern bamboo rod so it, we always say it we keep the tradition but we put it in kind of a modern package so to say nice like that like that wants you to move on and you have a phd in a scientific background does this affect how you look at things like fly tying for example or perhaps entomology actually i think it is well i'm i'm geneticist i'm not so much zoologist i i do like 
zoology, especially birds and fish. I do read a lot about this, but I'm not an expert. I mean, to the scientific degree. But I think the scientific set of mind kind of does affect my approach and how I how I go after fly fishing. Because once you go to the river, it's sort of like being in a lab. It's experiments, you know. You try this, you try that. This, this is how I fish, actually. I I try, fail until it works. This is kind of my my idea. Sometimes you think and like, what do you do? It's ridiculous. Maybe it doesn't work. But in the end, it doesn't work. And then you make like, oh, I see. This is how this experiment works. This is the how you have to approach it, and this is how it's done. So this, I think, the, fly, the scientific kind of mind does affect my fly fishing too. So does that mean you'll come back from a day on the water, let's say you're fishing for asp, and you've noticed something, and you think, actually, I need to change that a little bit, and will those changes be radical, or will they be smaller little tweaks to a fly pattern that you think might work a little bit better small tweaks i think yeah it also depends on the season so i i i have to really you have to really fish the whole season for us to really learn which range of flies work i do have a favorite streamer that took me a while to develop that one unfortunately is too good it's like almost 100 percent effective but nevertheless i still try other streamers and see like if the eye color can be changed or if you add additional little stripes or a little bit of fluorescence like all these things i always try i think as i said experiments the sky is the limit you can always try new things and are you one of these people who likes to sit down and tie a bunch of flies or do you tie one or two and then see how they work out I tie flies before the trips. I, I always promised myself that I always should sit down in the winter and prepare for the season, but I'm unfortunately always fail in this. I, but I actually enjoy of this idea of preparation for the trip. I think this is for most exciting for me. As now, I sit down and I think what fish would take. I talk to people. I try to tie flies specific for the trip. It's it's part of me, adventure for me. So I often end up, unfortunately, sitting nights before the trips and trying a bunch of flies instead of preparing in advance. <laughs> like you say, that's part of it, isn't it? It's not just the moment you step into the water that you're about to fish. It's the lead up to it, isn't it? It's the preparation. It's getting the kit together. It's getting all of those things is a, a big part of it too, isn't it? Is it? It is. I, you told this many times. Like I always promise myself, you should get a good sleep, but I I can't sleep before the before the trips of going fly fishing. I like constantly all these things in my head, wake me up and keep me. But yeah, I I love this process. I actually, sometimes love it even more than actual fishing day. I think this part is exciting. Yeah. So do you like? I I'm, I think I know the answer to this. Coming back to flies. I'm guessing that your fly box is organized and tidy. No, it's absolutely <laughs> not. It's like, I, I'm even afraid to show it to people because they would think that I'm like not mentally stable, to be honest. It's like total mess. And it also comes from this multi-species hunting hobby because I have... In one, I try to keep one box only. And you can imagine in that box you have everything it's from streamer, carp flies, dry fly, nymphs, or you can imagine, and some of my crazy idea flies that I tie one time and never use them, but I still hope that one day they will be useful. But it's kind of a mess. I try to always, after fishing, go home and like a little bit, at least put the flies inside the foam that they are not lying around in the box like crazy. But yeah, it's not so organized. I'm a bit ashamed of it. But Don't be ashamed. Embrace it. And you're amongst friend, friends here as well. And I'm sure we're all very, very similar. I know mine's a shambles and I tried to sort mine out the other day and it's looking good at the moment, but it won't be by the end of September when we pack up. So you're absolutely fine. Now, we talked a little while back as well about you saying wanting to make some fishing films. And again, this has got me thinking about what you was, we were talking about, explaining how to fish these things and uh, fish for asp or pike or carp or those sorts of things. Is this something that you've always had an interest in or is it something you're thinking about exploring? I always had interest in this. Um, a long time ago, before even fly fishing, I was a little bit a uh, fan of photography. So I did a lot of uh, photos and stuff. 
And then slowly as we advanced with the, with the cameras and everything, then the video started to be kind of part of my, uh, something that I'm interested in. But it's a very demanding thing. Uh, I actually always people watch on YouTube these perfect fly fishing movies and they cannot even imagine how much effort you have to put on this one, like how much filming, how much deleted scenes and, and all of this. And the second problem is, as, as, as you as you ask me whether I fish alone, and I do fish alone, and filming yourself, is it's absolute pain, I would say. These old tripods, everything is falling, everything is not right, you don't really see what is filmed. So I consider video making, I have a lot of respect to those that make really good fine movies. Like seriously, this is so much effort, so much work. Video editing is also a very tedious process. It takes a while. You have to build it. It looks like a story and everything. So I was doing it for a while. I don't do it much. Actually, about the ASP, I, I will try to assemble something after this podcast. Maybe it actually will post it on my YouTube at the time when it comes out. Because it took me a while to actually film how they attack and the places where they live. But I think I got a little bit of footage that maybe would be useful. As I said, I did a few movies, but I, I try not to focus on this because at the end of the day, you come to the decision. It's either you make the film or you fish. You have to decide. You can't very often do both. Or you have to bring someone along. Then I can film other people. This is no problem. But filming yourself, it's yeah, it's too difficult. Yeah. And like you said, the editing, and my daughter's a photographer, and I know editing is the tricky part of the whole process. And when those films go out, I don't think people always realize how much has, has gone into that. And that is the hardest part of it. I often think about and talk with people about is, is the editing, isn't it? Yeah. And even like a small aspect, small, tiny thing can really ruin the film. Like I, I think I was trying to do one project and it was filmed with GoPro a lot. And the sound is just terrible. And I tried everything possible. I can't, I can't restore the sound. And like, without the sound, this movie does not make any sense. And it's kind of, you have to really pay attention to all these things. And so, as I say, in the end of the day, one has to decide what do I really enjoy doing. Yeah. I saw or heard an interview just a couple of days ago about the film The French Connection. And there's a famous car chase in there. And they said it took five weeks to film it. And oh, that's gosh. probably just a few moments of film. I guess you had to close roads and fitting around that aspect of it. But yes, the editing, the shooting, all the things that go along with that must have been a horrific process. Yet, I guess the film is known for that car chase but yeah that gives a sense of what goes into some of these things and people who make these films have my utmost respect i have to say but we've talked about some wonderful places we've talked about some wonderful fishing do you have a dream destination is there somewhere that you would really love to go well the simple answer would be any destination that has new species that i haven't caught yet but uh yeah i'm kind of running out of uh, species here in the places where I live because I caught most of them. So you have to travel a lot. I love, and of course, I have dream destinations. If I would have to say one, I always dream about Caribbeans. This is my ultimate dream, but this requires a lot of time and finances. So I will see. I'll, I'll have it as a dream for now, but let's see. Maybe it will materialize. And what species would you like from there? Um, yeah, classical, there's a bonefish, tarpon, and the company that comes with it, if possible. I think bonefish mostly. They are so fast and so cool. And actually, I think that when you are a carp angler, it actually helps you. I hope it helps you to prepare actually for the flats because this patience, the, the quiet presentation and everything, this also is in carp fishing. So, yeah. Like I'm thinking maybe I would not be that bad if I would go to Caribbean, but you never know. <laughs> and I guess there's a little bit of a, almost a crossover on fly patterns in some respects, isn't there? Or close to it. Yeah. These bonefish flies, they do look a little bit similar to the carp 
twice i would say yeah so principle is the same it's a heavy name feel a little bit presented to the bottom let it a little bit move and then it reacts for the moment of the fly and is it similar for you when you are carp fishing are you stalking these fish in in shallowish water that you're getting a good look at the behavior of them yeah yeah i i'm most of the time i see the fish so i I try to strategically place the nymph. I see where the fish moves, like how it behaves. And yeah, but you have to find this, the same fish, like by, by bone fishing, we call them happy feeding fish. Yeah. So they are not too much distracted from what's happening around them. So you can present the fly without spooking them. But if they are wary and you can actually learn it from the body language, like you can learn a lot, like how, the, what the mood of the fish is, is it what it's going to do. As I said, this is part of fun of the fly fishing for carp. You you learn about the fish a lot. You see things that you couldn't even imagine the carps are doing under the water. So I find this super fascinating and fun. And you mention yourself as a multi-species angler, but would I would it be fair to say that you're also a fish stalker as well in that sense that getting the feel back from you that you like to see the fish the behavior of the fish and your presentation to the fish okay yeah fish stalker that sounds scary yeah, <laughs> yeah. um yeah i like to observe the fish a lot i think everybody should observe the fish before making the cast and going back again to the asp i always if i would take someone and explain them how to do it i was like really prepare yourself make sure that the leader is not tangled the line is like because that first cast will decide everything sometimes they will always take on the first cast because they are they're already sitting and patrolling there and they're like waiting for free offerings that you provide with the streamer so i unfortunately done that mistake where i was like playing with the streamer you know just to straighten the leader and stuff and i got like takes that without the hooking them so from that i'm super careful before i make a first cast nice and so what are your plans for the rest of the year how does that evolve as as temperatures change and seasons change what what are you up to yeah, I, as I said, like we have really hot days right now. So I fish for trout at the beginning of the season, May, June, and then I just leave them be because it's, it's too hot. And then there is sometimes hopper season when the temperature allows uh, to make sense of fishing for trout without hurting them too much. But yeah, I mostly focus on the carp and I, and then from September, October, it's pike. Yeah, pike will be the main focus. Uh, we will have another trip for to Norway where we meet with team. Uh, there is one species that I haven't caught there yet. I also keep my fingers crossed for it. Uh, it's whitefish, actually. Uh, you talk a lot about this also on podcasts. Yeah, I never caught those whitefish before. So there is small chance to catch one on the dry fly there. And I'm hoping I will focus on that fish before I go for anything else. But it's River Rana. It's kind of a famous one. I think you know that one. It's a good grading destination, really big brown trouts. Actually, my friend suggested me that we should do a grand slam. It's when you catch white fish, grayling, brown trout, and pike on the same day, which is, sounds like an incredible challenge to me. But yeah, why not? We'll see. Maybe it will work. That sounds fantastic. And yes, I share your love for white fish and hope that you get lucky with one of those as well. They're, they're fabulous fish. But I'm going to move on to the tricky question now and a song for the playlist for the fly culture road trip playlist what have you got for me it's not a tricky question i actually like this question because i already have a song for it and as i told you already off mic that this is the song that i was playing when you invited me to the podcast so actually from now on i will associate the songs only with the podcast and you maybe or maybe it's already on the playlist it's a uh, depeche mode enjoy the silence it's, it's my favorite not, song. but very good. Very good choice. Actually, when you listen to the text, it reflects a lot on our hobby. And, you know, sometimes we need that little silence by the stream to catch the fish. And that's all that we need. That is a very, very good choice. They're from the neck of the woods where I grew up as well. So uh, I always have a soft spot for them. So, And they're great, wonderful musicians, songwriters as well. So that's a fabulous choice. But it's been absolutely wonderful talking with you. And I think we could have carried on talking for a whole lot more. 
where if people want to learn aside from your uh, social media which i'm going to ask uh, for very shortly but is there anything have you made films about asp that people can because you mentioned your youtube channel and i wondered if you'd made any films for asp that a after we've finished talking that i can go and watch and perhaps listeners can as well have you done that or is there anywhere that that people can learn a little bit more about this fish um i myself don't have any movies about asp fishing yet as i said i will try to prepare one i'm actually currently trying to assemble it at the moment um but i have to say in internet on youtube in general there are not so many movies about fly fishing for asp there are some that are still good people can go and check those out um but yeah i think it's kind of a still uh, division that can be explored more and filmed more but as i said maybe it's not easy to film because it's it's a difficult fish to catch at the end still because i i gave some people instructions just virtual guiding and try to send them and make them catch them and they could not so maybe these little tiny details that has to be explored or showed to the people how to catch that fish but yeah i, I will try to assemble something maybe i will send it to you by the time we will post this maybe it will exist this movie you can check this out and see approximately the area where i fish yeah, I have YouTube channel, but my movies are not that spectacular. They're just just nature, observation. I try to explore also this idea of like using public transport also to go fly fish because uh, it's possible and why not? Yeah, so you can go check my channel. It's called the same as Alex Red Hat. And if you find something interesting there, then I will be happy to hear that. Do you think the asp scene is a small one and that's why it's not talked about a lot or is it because as you've just said because there are difficult fish to catch what do you why do you think we don't know so much about them i actually don't know uh, one thing that you have to remember is actually in germany it's called i think it belongs to invasive species i think the wild it's not a native fish in uk in uk first of all you don't have it i once posted asp on the uh fly fishing for coarse fish or group or something like this and some people didn't even know what this fish was or mistaken it for something else and and then I realized that the majority of people in that group are from UK, and I always forget that you don't have those fish. I think you start having them somewhere in Sweden, a little bit further north, but they are native species for the eastern regions of the Europe. This is where they come from. But I think they are not native to Germany. But actually in Germany, it's pretty popular fish to catch. Like many people catch them on small walkers or wobblers and stuff. But... I think it deserves more attention as a fly fishing fish I, because it's it's absolutely designed for fly fishing. I don't know. It's it's everything, you know, stocking fish, being careful, correct presentation, sometimes longer casts because you have to stay away from the fish, not to spook it. It's absolutely gorgeous challenge. And I highly recommend for people that have ability to catch, the, uh, have ability to go after that fish, seriously should do it. One of the questions I thought I should have asked you as well, what sort of size are you catching fish on? I know it's going to be a rather broad spectrum, but what is a standard sort of size asp and, and what line weights are you fishing for them with? Yeah, you have to help me out with inches as well or something. I'm going to say in centimeters, so I think it's five centimeters maximum. So what is it like? Two inches, maybe. Yeah, something like I'm terrible because I'm only in inches and I don't know centimeters. Yeah, well. I know. So, uh, what about poundage or kilos? Ah, uh, how big? Oh, you t- you were yeah. asking about the streamers or the size of the fish? Oh, sorry, sorry. no, the size of the fish. Sorry. Uh, yeah, size of the fish. Yeah, it's most where I fish. They're big fish, so they are. Um, I catch the regular size around from 65 to 80 centimeters so they can go from two to four or five kilos but they actually the take is brutal i also for the for the people that will do this i'm saying hold on to your rods like there is no tomorrow because i once almost got the rod grabbed from me because they come as a surprise you don't really actually know when the fish will come and the take is absolutely brutal. It's like they just go for the money. They they will kill this thing and try to run away. They are not, at the end, the biggest fighters, but this 10 seconds of life with the take, worth living. 
telling you it's i highly recommend it you've got me on the hook you have got me on the hook they sound absolutely fantastic well we've been talking for an hour now and i wondered if we could get your contact details if people want to uh, touch base with you if they want to follow what you're up to how do people find you yeah um right so i mentioned youtube channel already um i do have instagram account same name as mine um I do Facebook as well. We have uh, actually a group of Arctic Silver fans there. Feel free to join and see how what we are doing with our rods. So I mainly maintain that fan page. I don't do some more personal stuff on Facebook, but Instagram, I think, would be the best way, I guess. And folks, that's Alex Red Hat. So search that out and follow the man with the red hat. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Alex, for being a great guest. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed chatting with you. Thank you so much for being a guest on the Fly Coach podcast. Thank you. Well, everyone, this has been another episode of the Fly Culture Podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this one as much as me. I hope you have got some ASP fever as well, because I certainly am showing the early stages of it. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and listening to Alex as well. I hope you reach out to him, see what he's up to, because it's good having people like this in fly fishing and it's wonderful to be able to connect with them, to be able to talk with them as well. So I've really, really enjoyed that. As ever, there'll never be any charge for these. I just love talking about fly fishing with people. And I hope you've enjoyed this episode. And of course, there'll be plenty more episodes coming very, very soon. Thanks so much for listening. The Fly Culture podcast is brought to you in association with Fly Culture, a quarterly published magazine owned and run by fly anglers. When it comes to fly fishing, we've got you covered.